first, we will review linear models, which is of course the linear combination of all the attributes of the data. Linear models are straightforward to construct and to apply. So in this advanced data analytics course, we will not get into the technical details of the construction and uh, usage of those models. However, we will use linear models as demonstration tools to show how the learning framework works and to show how those models generalize to the samples that are unseen in the training stage. Linear models make a simple and effective family of analytic tools. If they work in, on the given data, they generally work, keep working reliably for the unseen cases you may encounter in future. So in practice, given some analytic problem, it um, almost always be a good idea to try linear models first. Decision trees. Decision trees represent the natural and intuitive approach of organizing the data into multiple groups. Basically, if one follows a decision tree, one arrives a conclusion of the data by asking a series of questions. Each is concerned with an individual attribute of the data. Decision trees are developed in the last 90s among the first generation of data analysis tools. They are no longer considered as the most effective and the most advanced tools nowadays. However, decision trees have a couple of intriguing properties so that they are hugely welcomed in practical industrial data analysis and they are worthy studying in our course. Decision trees are very forgiving if the form of the data is irregular. For example, one node of the tree may, dealing with, uh, uh, may deal with uh, numerical data and uh, the other may deal with uh, categorical data. They systematically cooperate in the tree structure. This property largely frees one from the art of data pre-processing, which can be a huge relief. Another attractive property of decision trees is that the model the output is interpretable. Given a sample, how a decision tree makes decisions about the sample is clear. If the prediction is wrong, it is generally possible to find where it is going wrong. Moreover, the computational model of decision trees is efficient. So the trees are often used as building blocks of a more sophisticated statistical method, such as one approach is to employ multiple data models and integrate their predictions by voting. Decision trees can be used as component in such method. From the learning's point of view, the hypothesis set employed by decision trees is quite different from those employed by many other methods. So studying decision trees allows us to approach the problem from a unique perspective. Neural networks are hierarchical models include multiple stages of computation, gradually transform the observation from the domain of X to the target, which are in the domain of Y. The neural networks has a long history. The study of the neural networks started as soon as people tried to make smart machines to discover patterns in data automatically. However, these models are quite complex 
and only recently breakthrough has been made, so that we are able to train complex and multi-stage neural network model effectively. Deep neural networks have performed very well in a couple of uh, exciting and notoriously difficult areas, such as natural language processing, detecting objects from images, recognizing people by face. In this course, we will look into what is going on under the bonnet of learning with a neural network. We will study how the learning algorithm navigates through the hypothesis space of the neural network model, which have many parameters and uh, therefore have a very complex hypothesis space to explore. These techniques are specific data models, which we remind its interplay between the hypothesis set and the algorithm that select one hypothesis that matches the data. Let's mark the study on the data models with blue. On the other hand, we consider those models realizes the learning framework. So on the theoretical side, all the models can be studied under the banner of the learning framework. If we can establish that learning is possible in this framework, then we can harvest the theoretical benefit for all those data models. Given appropriate conditions, all those models are guaranteed to work, as well as all the models that are developed in the similar manner. Let, let's mark the theoretical aspects in our study using yellow color. Remember that the theoretical guarantee comes from the argument when individual hypotheses are assessed by the learning algorithm. Those assessments will not or is unlikely to be very far from the truth. An alternative view of the problem is rather than considering individual hypotheses, we take an overview on the space of all possible hypotheses, the capital H, and consider how well we can explore this space given the data. Let's say the goal is a target function f. If we consider a um, limited small hypothesis set, we call it HS. There are limited candidates in HS. Even if we can explore this set thoroughly and find the optimal hypothesis in HS to approximate F, let the optimal candidate in HS, GS, GS will still be a distance away from the true target F. If, on the other hand, we consider a large hypothesis set that is uh, very versatile, so much so that it includes F as one of its candidates, then the problem will be that if you start from any certain point in this huge hypothesis set, call it HL, your data may only allow you search a very localized area. So you may not be able to reach very close to the true target F. See, the result of searching in HL be GL. It is likely that GL will still be not the same as F, although F is indeed a candidate within HL but it is generally not reachable by the searching algorithm. If we call the difference between the hypothesis produced by a learning algorithm and the true target error, then there are two types of errors. One type is caused by the limited capacity of the entire hypothesis 
candidate set, and we call them buyers. The other is caused by our incapability of exploring large complex hypothesis set. After learning, we see that hypothesis set still have better to offer, but just our data doesn't allow us to reach it. We call this type of errors variance. If you like, you can consider the bias and the variance in an analogy of buying lottery tickets. If you have a couple of favorite combinations, you can go out and buy all of them. But the chances of your small set of combinations, include, including the award-winning F, is small. On the other hand, if you consider a lot of combinations, if you buy all the tickets, you can almost guarantee to win the lottery. But the problem will be that the cost will be so high that the award becomes no longer worthy winning. So, what will you do? You start with a lucky combination, and play with the numbers as long as your budget allows you. Using this strategy, you may finally still miss the lottery, and regret that I have thought of those combinations. How come if in the first case, the small number of combinations actually include the lottery winning F. Or, in the second case, if you are lucky and just start very close to F, and you eventually discover F within your budget. Well, that's a brilliant idea relying on sheer luck for those lottery winners. But this course is for the rest of us. It is about advanced data analytics. It is not about how to invent hypotheses and win lotteries. In real scenarios of analytics, most data models involve both buyers and variance. The proportion of these two types of errors differs in different models, of course and actually varies in different tasks. Generally speaking, simple models tend to have more buyers than variance, while complex models often have large variance but small buyers. The theoretical analysis on how to strike a prosperous trading off between buyers and variance is not surprisingly called Bias versus violence. From this line of theoretical analysis, an intriguing set of theoretical schemes has been derived. These are under the umbrella term resampling methods. The basic idea is to randomly take a subset of your data and uh, apply the same analysis tools multiple times. This almost sounds like cheating and uh, violates the rule of no free lunch. However, carefully designed resampling strategies are great data analysis tools and come to our help in multiple aspects. We will study resampling techniques helps us to choose an appropriate data model that is model selection. By resampling the data, we can also form multiple versions of a base data model, which is called a model ensemble. The integrated prediction by pulling the ensemble is often superior than those made by any of the base models. We will study specific resampling algorithms, including both model selection methods and ensemble algorithms. When it comes to making multiple hypotheses working together, the Bayesian school of learning takes this matter to an extreme. Instead of picking up 
one hypothesis and keep it for future predictions. A Bayesian learner keeps all possible hypotheses in pocket. When it comes to predictions, it goes to democracy and let all hypotheses predict and takes the average of the predictions. Mm. Wait a minute, you may ask. If you invent all the hypotheses and averages all their predictions as your final verdict, then what is the role played by the data? Well, as it turns out, instead of a democracy among the hypotheses, it's a technocracy. Some hypotheses are more equal than the others. Here joins the data in the scheme. For each hypothesis, the data is used to measure how plausible the hypothesis is. The plausibility is computed using some reverse thinking. We ask, assuming the hypothesis is true, how likely is that we observe those data? The likelihood is then used to assess the hypothesis. Given the weighted hypothesis space, predictions are made by taking the weighted sum of the predictions. The scheme is called technocracy among the hypotheses because it weighs the prediction a hypothesis made according to how well that hypothesis can explain the data. The more skillful in interpreting the data a hypothesis is, the greater its option will be respected. Consider this so-called Bayesian hypothesis, G bar. I use the bar to show that this guy is not simple and individual. It is loaded. The prediction it makes about some x is consolidated over all the hypotheses, given that we have observed data d. The entire school of Bayesian learning makes an extremely rich and extensive research field, and we cannot explore thoroughly in this course. But we will study basic Bayesian models on how to summarize the predictions over the entire hypothesis space. We will also consider how to form posterior assessment of the hypothesis after observing the data. So far, we have seen about half a dozen techniques belonging to three schools of theoretical view on the data analysis or learning problem. There are still interesting issues that carry both theoretical significance and technical innovation. For example, regularization, which trims the hypothesis space of a data model for simplified result and hope for better generalization. Arguably, the most famous and successful example is the supporter vector machines. In this example, the data are to be classified in two classes. If the data model is linear, there are many choices of the hypothesis that can distinguish the observed samples very well. Supporter vector machines, however, limit the choices by requiring that the separation margin to be maximized. It turns out that this extra requirement that simplifies our choices often leads to superior generalization. Supporter vector machines are closely related to a set of techniques 
that transform the data into a new space where the analysis task can be easily performed. Mathematically, transforming the data space is equivalent to introducing new ways of measuring the distance between data samples or to compute the inner products or between those samples using tricks called kernels. If we consider the problem of transforming data samples into a more meaningful representation or measuring the distance between the samples, reflecting their internal relationship, these topics can be studied regardless a desired output for each sample or the target value. This branch of data analysis is generally called unsupervised learning. Doing analysis without a specifically defined target is possible because even the desired label has been removed from uh, each data point. There are generally discoverable patterns in the distribution of the data samples. Regarding the distribution of the data, the techniques we have considered so far are all assuming that we have identically distributed independent data samples. Sometimes this assumption is not entirely appropriate for practice. For example, in the stock market, the share price of a company is determined or at least affected by so many time, timely matters that if you collect the samples of the price from a period, it might be a better idea than treating those samples are all from the same unchanging distribution. So there are statistical methods that are specialized in the independency between the uh, within the data. So now we have drawn a very rough map of the so-called advanced data analytics. So what is our plan? You may notice that those blue guys are concrete. They are specific algorithms and techniques. You can play with them on a computer, and eventually you will take them home to deal with your customers and the bosses. Or can you and can they? Isn't it entirely possible that in practice you encounter a problem that can be comfortably, comfortably handled by none of them? So here come the yellow guys. They are theoretical statistical perspectives toward data analytics. We touch three schools of ideas, the learnability and the generalization, the bias versus variance, and the Bayesian view of the problem. They cannot directly help you on any practical problems from the philosophical level but they can help you learn the algorithms so that you do not need to memorize them but understand them. But more importantly, we will get an understanding on how those algorithms are originally designed, how they are motivated from a particular scenario, and why they can do nothing but work. The understanding is vital in practical problem solving. So here is our plan. We will introduce the algorithms with varying uh, details of course. Linear models, decision trees, neural network, ensemble methods, and uh, uh, some Bayesian techniques. Along the way we will glance at the theoretical aspects of the problem with more emphasis on the learnability because generalization is what ultimately matters in many practical scenarios. 
In our map, the algorithms are grouped along with particular theoretical perspectives. This more or less reflects the relationship between different research branches, and uh, brings us uh, convenience for introduction. Uh, however, the borderlines are by no means rigid. For example, there is nothing stops you from analyzing neural networks from a basin view. There are also some extra topics. Extra definitely does not mean unimportant. They are extra just because they are not in the most, uh, not in the primeval taxonomy of data analytics. Based on our time and the progress, we may consider the topics as um, uh, let's mark them using the green color, support vector machines and the kernel methods, the data representation and the unsupervised learning, mostly uh, clustering. We may also consider data uh, of time series or has some complex structure like graphs.